Okay, it is now being recorded. Okay, let's go ahead and get started then. I'm uh, uh, keep your mics on mute if you uh, if you have a chance. A couple of them ended up turned on there. I turned them off real quick, and uh, we should be in good shape. And we'll we'll start from there. First off, let's uh, jump up on one one of the slides. First off, welcome that uh, and thanks for for uh, for joining us, and thanks to the to Jim Drago and the Mazda, MazdaRacers.com website for, uh, for hosting this and, and, and uh, getting us all set up. Uh, I know your time is valuable. 90 minutes is, uh, you know, on a, on a nice evening. Um, to, to learn a little bit, that's probably a good thing, but I do appreciate you being here and, uh, and, uh, and, and trying to learn a few things and, and pass some stuff back and forth on the chat board as we go. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm alone here right now, but my son Andrew will be here shortly to to uh, to kind of chat, follow that along, and help me uh, keep up with the questions that come in. So I will keep glancing over there, and uh, and try to keep up. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to also go just give you just a little bit about AIM Sports, what we do, some of our support stuff that we're doing nowadays, just to give get you a good idea. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the webinar 1.0. Although I'm going to last pass that fairly fairly quickly. I added uh, probably another eight or ten slides this afternoon to the. To the material, so I think we're going to be pretty pretty tight on uh, tight on uh, pretty tight on time. So um, we'll we'll go past that fairly quickly, and then we're going to just jump right in. It's it's better use of your data acquisition is where we're going to head, and it's and uh, the, the the title of the of the webinar is the, the racers data acquisition triangle, and the way that I look at this and uh, has been working really well for us is uh, the um, you know driver performance, vehicle performance, or vehicle health. Almost all of the data always fits into one of those one of those windows, at uh, at some point, uh, uh, one of those buckets of information, and uh, and that. So I always kind of look at it in that way, and, and okay, what am I trying to work on at this point? Is it vehicle performance, driver performance, or the vehicle health? So that's what we're going to look at, and then and then at the end, um, I should have some time left over, and I've got a a few additional uh, tips and tricks of the of the Ray Studio software and some things that we can do as well. So. That's where we're going to go. Okay, let me jump ahead one. Um, already talked a little bit about. Uh, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, data is critical to your success. It, it's motorsports, and and uh, and really, there's uh, you know it, it, we're all after one or two things. One of them is you know more speed, and the other one's lower lap times. And and uh, those are what I call the money channels. And 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 if you don't learn how to to use this very valuable tool, it's going to end up being a, you know, a lot harder to get to those things. And, and uh, data is just another tool in your toolbox. It's, you know, it's just like a wrench and, you know, and a drill and, and some of these other things. If you buy it and you, and you don't understand how to use it, it's, it's, it's not a very uh, added value to your, to your program. So it's, it's there. You, most of you have it or, or, or thinking about getting, and it's, and it's uh, it's very achievable to make this work for you, but it's it's not automatic. You know, it's uh, you you do have to implement it. You do have to work at it just a little bit. It's it's like uh, if you never adjusted your your air fuel ratios, and you know it's sitting there, and you and you never do anything, and you're not going to get the value out of uh, the most value out of your engine. So so keep keep that in mind, and uh, and 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 continue to uh, to work it and and. Uh, we have we have, we continue to have some mics that keep coming on. Just so you know, if you kind of keep your eye on that, and uh, I'm not sure if it's as you're jumping in and out or, or or what it is, but uh, if you're if you're not muted, please please mute yourself if you can. And um, so it's um, it is achievable to to do these things. So if uh, what I don't want you to have is a very expensive lap timer that uh, that has no other value other than showing you lap times while you're out there, although that is valuable. So. Just keep that in mind, and, and let's try to try to use all the data systems to their to their utmost extent. Um, data. What is data? You know, data is hardware and it is software. It's really a package deal. But but the software is where you live, and that's why we're going to spend so much time on the on the analysis side today. And uh, it's it's that hardware. Once you get it set up, and once it's out there and it's working, it, it tends to just uh, just work and work and work. And and uh, and after every session, you spend your time in the hardware. So that's where we really want to do some more of the training. So we're going to do that, looking at the data acquisition triangle. Just a little bit about me. I, I know I know quite a few of you, but just to give you an idea, the uh, the. Um, a little bit of a background. I, I was an off-road racer for a, for a lot of years, and then. And then I retired, and Andrew wanted to get into karting, and, and um, 
it's got this little red dot here that you can probably see. And uh, in 1998, we purchased a cart, and it had a data logger on it. It was the you know the very early, the very first AIM Sports uh, carting data logger at the time. And uh, then uh, moved on through the different classes, and then ended up in a in a in a legend and a bandolero. And, uh, and they didn't, at the time, they allowed some data, and we kind of pushed the rules, limits of the rules a little bit and ended up, uh, they ended up changing those. But we used data in the Legends and the Bandoleros quite a bit as well. And then into Spec Miata, and uh, in 2006, Andrew won the, the national championship, and, uh, and, and we got an MX-5 Cup car, and then, uh, and, and then a Mustang Challenge, a little bit of Grand Am, and then into the off-road trucks. The, the interesting thing about when I look back on this is all of these cars were all date all had data systems they all had spec series spec series classes so they all um, all were uh, very important to to run the the data systems as as powerful and as strongly as possible and learn as much as we could because if uh, you, you can't just go out and buy another motor and get a little bit more horsepower or something like that you you had to uh, you had to uh, to make all that stuff work as best as you can. Except maybe Spec Miata, you can probably go get a little bit more power, right? So uh, the uh, the uh, trying to look around here, I keep getting some audio that keeps coming in. So if all you can just kind of keep your eye on that little that little uh, microphone, make sure we uh, we keep that. I, I, I assume it's going on to the the recording. I'm not too sure. So uh, the um, all of these all of these data all of these classes that we ran in all taught us things that uh, to get the last little bit out of each one and that's why uh, that's why we we learned as much as we have about data and one more I'm hearing some noise out there still I'm muting as many of uh, many of these as I can. I think I've got everybody muted at this point. And one more. There we go. Okay, a little bit more about AIM. It, it, uh, I just give you this slide that you can take a look at, uh, take a look back later if you want to. Uh, AIM's been around for a little bit of, for for quite a bit. We've got two stores: one in uh, Lake Elsinore and one in Roanoke for repairs and such, and um, and a toll-free number that runs across to, to the different places depending on where where you are in the country. So there's your guys that you, to to help get a little support, and, you know, fix any broken part, parts or anything like that, uh, and of course at the racetrack. Won't spend a ton of time on that. Uh, AIM is at uh, you know we have guys at uh, at the track virtually every weekend somewhere, and uh, so you'll see our, uh, our our sprinter vans at the track with our with our pop up tents and and uh, if you see those guys make sure you stop by say hi and um, and get them to fix up your or fine tune or upgrade your firmwares or whatever it needs to be they're out there for you. Doing a lot of seminars and training just like we have today. You know this is the first webinar and uh, that we're doing this year, but uh, a lot of at on-site uh, training and, and seminars as well. This is just for the first quarter of 2014. April's pretty much filled up as well. So we'll be out there around if, uh, you know, this is a 90-minute one. If you want to get a little bit deeper and we come into your neck of the woods, make sure you stop by and uh, we, we have these these eight-hour seminars that get much deeper into this stuff. So uh, let me know if there's anything there you that, uh, that you want to go to. We have some videos out there for you. You know those are those are available to you if you go to the uh, go to this uh, this Vimeo.com Aim Sports video site. There's about 20 videos out there right now that uh, that um, show all the, the little things that uh, that that make the, the software so much easier if you uh, if you're able to to watch them solve those problems and 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 understand things and and get over that hump pretty quickly. That this is the same site that uh, the, the webinar 1.0 from the MazdaRacer.com website is, uh, is is held at too. Current software and firmware, just a listing for you if you want to take a look at that. I just wanted to include that in there for you. Firmware and software updates are 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 now and always have been and always will be for free. So keep that in mind. Okay, a little bit about data and 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 the concepts of data analysis is the way that I look at it and uh, to to work and get the best out the most out of your data analysis is of course we've already talked a little bit about the data triangle, the vehicle performance and the 
the, the driver performance, vehicle performance, and vehicle health. That's kind of where we're looking at the data. And then, and I mentioned it once already, but the money channels. That's what, the way that I look at the data is lap times and speed are the things that are critical. And the other, all those other channels, which we have a ton of, possibly on your data logger, is all those channels support why your lap times came down or your speed went up. Hopefully it went that direction. And that, uh, and, and why did those things happen? And that's, they're very, very, very critical channels. But in reality, what we're really all searching for is lap times to go down and speed to go up. And, uh, and those other ones really help us understand why. And a little bit on the analyzing side is, is, is you grab this data, you download it, you sit down, and you look at a couple of speed traces, and you're, 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 you're a little bit slow in, in turn two, let's say. And the, uh, so you're, you, you, you determine what the vehicle is doing. OK, I'm, I'm a little bit slow in, in, in turn two. The trouble is, is many stop there, and uh, and and that's really a shame because that you're just getting started as far as really helping make this thing work for you, the, the process work for you. Okay, I know I'm slow in turn two. You just go out and drive faster. I mean, you probably would have already been driving faster if uh, if if that was all the only problem is it's it, there's something else there. So so we need to dig into the data a little bit deeper, and we need to understand when the vehicle is doing it. Is it is it part of is the problem on the braking side? Is it is it the turn in? Is it the apex? Is it the exit on the throttle late or you know the dr the driven line or you know what is you know when is when and where is this happening and why is it doing it? Those are critical points. So you don't know what to go fix and what to go work on. Is it the driver? Is it the is it the chassis? Is it the is it the motors? Is it the brakes? We need to understand those pieces of it. So don't just determine that you're slow or fast. You know, if you want to look at it on the positive side, you don't just understand that. Okay, I'm I'm quicker there. You want to repeat that every single session, every single time. So so you need to understand why you are quicker. And then the last, you know, the the these two down here, a little bit at the bottom, is the driver reacting to what the vehicle is doing. Or is the driver creating the vehicle's reaction? Those are those are important things to me to to understand. If I've got that big wrench out and I'm going to go to work on the car because of you know it's doing X, is do I take that wrench to the you know change the camber or do I take that wrench and hit the driver over the head? Right? Is uh, which one do I work on? And uh, and and that's an important piece of this. And, and you can look from the data, and we're going to look at some data samples here in a little bit, and see did the car react first and then the driver had to react to catch it or did the driver do something with his hands or feet that created that vehicle to do what it did so we need to understand that because that's a critical difference in in how we uh, how we go about fixing the problem and get faster there's some reference materials out there I wanted to leave the you know leave a slide up there for you to take a look at the one that I'm been the happiest with lately is the practical guide to race car data analysis you know it's available out there it's uh, it's a book by uh, Bob Knox and um, and uh, very enjoyable book to to read as far as data. It's very practical. Very it does it, it, while it does get into some of the math channels and the engineering side of it a little bit, but it's uh, he still has wrote it in a way that it's very uh, very easy to read. If you want to uh, a little bit more information about that, drop me an email note when we're done, and uh, I can get you some some uh, information where to go buy that and uh, and possibly a little bit of a, a, a discounted uh, document that'll get you like 15% off too. So nothing that AIM gets. It's just Bob has been nice enough to allow. Our, uh, our our webinar and seminar customers to uh, to get a little discount on that book. So let me know if you want that, and we'll uh, we'll get that to you in an, in an email. Okay, if you're uh, if everything is okay out there, drop me a drop me a thing on the meeting chat. Everything is going well. We're going to dig in and uh, and uh, and jump in deeper. Is the is the audio okay? And everybody seeing everything okay? Great, thank you. Thanks everybody. Looks like it's okay. Okay. We're going to jump in and look at some, remember our three, you know, our data acquisition triangle. So the first piece we're going to look at is, is driver performance. And the way that I've done the, done the, the webinar here today is to, is to just look at um, those in that side of the triangle and just give you some, some data examples, of, some data analysis examples. We're not going to be able to dig in really deep you know, and, and which buttons to push and all that stuff, but it's really a primer to get you thinking about, you know, how to use data and, and just some different ways of doing it. So let's just, uh, let's take a look at the first one. This is, this is typically a, uh, a first shot that I usually look at. <clears throat> Pardon me. When I'm uh, working with a, a new driver or somebody that I'm working with, <clears throat> and uh, we just bring up a bunch of, of, um, speed traces 
So these are all speed traces, and they're laid right on top of each other. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven laps. And we throw all those speed traces up, and we start to look for <clears throat> look for areas of uh, of noise. And in the circled areas of one and two there, you can see that there's, there's some other areas too, but these are the ones that my eye w would go to real quickly. Of areas that there's just a bunch of different noise, that, uh, that, that the driver was not as consistent as uh, driver vehicle combination, was not as consistent as, uh, as what they might want, might wish. So, I mean, if you look at like, like this area up here at the hump above the 2,000 foot mark or so, you know, the, while there is a little bit of noise there, it's not terrible, and you can... Uh, it, that would not be my first place to go work, you know, you, you, that, that low-hanging fruit kind of a thing. You'd really want to look in, in the areas where the, the driver is not comfortable with the car or the driver is not comfortable with the track. You'd have to dig in a little bit deeper. This is the first thing. This is the what is happening. And this is the area that we'd want to go look. So you really, uh, you'd, you'd want to go look where all the noise is. You really would not care to go look at some of the areas where, where the driver is a, is a little bit more consistent. So when, if, you're, if you're a driver that just has just your own data, and uh, you, you can't share with anybody. This is a good way to, to uh, open up a, a bunch of, uh, of, of, your, of your decent laps and, uh, and take a look at it. Of course, you're going to have areas where you have, like, like here where I'm, where I'm highlighting, you've got two laps that were quite a bit slower, and you've got you know, the, uh, the other four or five that are, that are kind of bunched, you know, grouped together. And those two that are down there is, you know, possibly was traffic or, you know, uh, or something happened that, uh, that, that is out of the norm, out of the trend. So really your eye should be working up in the area where, there's, where, the, where there are no outliers. If you have a single outlier, don't let that affect your, uh, your, your judgment of what you're looking at. You really should be looking at the, the, the general trend of, of what you're looking for. You notice up here that there, I mean, the, there is no general trend. It's from top to bottom. There's a pretty big gap in that, in this high speed corner, the, the chicane on this particular track. And uh, this happens to be go-kart data, but it's, uh, the, the theory is exactly the same, obviously. So what we really want to do is the, the very first thing that I do when I'm working with somebody that I don't know or cars I don't know or tracks I don't know, I do this. And, and, and a lot of folks that we work with do this kind of a thing. And then that's the area you should fun work on. If you're the driver and the data guy, you probably already know this. You're, gonna, you're out there on the track and you're going through this, this turn one here and you're going... Boy, I just don't got that. You know, that uh, it's just not comfy yet. And uh, and then we'd want to dig in. Is it the car? Is it the driver? Is it the driven line? You know, we'd want to go and, and and try to help solve the problem and help the driver get through that corner better. So multiple speed traces uh, really helps understand where to go look when you first get started. If 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 anybody has any questions, you can pop them up in the chat bar. If uh, if you don't, everything's fine. The next one we're going to look at real quickly is, again, speed traces, uh, the money channel, right? Speed is the money channel. So we, we as, as racers, we tend to look at, you know, the speed at the end of the straightaway. And uh, don't need to teach you guys how to do that. We, we tend to look at that, and we tend to look at the, the exit speeds of the important uh, corners for the, for the straightaways that, that, uh, that resulting that follow those corners. So we're really interested in, in exit speeds out of these important corners, and also, of course, the, the main straightaway speed. But what I'd like to talk to you about a little bit uh, and, and look at ways of looking at the other side of the curve that, uh, that a lot of people never look at, and that's the, and that's the braking side. And, and understanding that there's a third of the data here that a lot of folks don't look at strongly enough. So I drew these red lines on here. This is not, this is not through Race Studio, but it's uh, it, it just PowerPoint, just drew some straight lines. Just to make it so you can see even more clearly that these braking zones that the driver has, has used the brakes on in, in, in this number one area here, you can see that he broke fairly hard right here and then had to release the brakes a little bit. Now we're going to make some assumptions here, just for our for our discussion, that it's a flat track, and that uh, and, and the grip levels are the same and, and all that. Of course, there could have been uh, this could drop off right here, you know, go over a hump and, and be an off camber corner entry. Or you know, there's all sorts of things that can do this. We'd want to look at some trends and make sure. But but let's for our sake of discussion, let's 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 assume a flat track and that uh, there's no gravel or oil on the track and everything is good. So the uh, the driver has came in here and has hit the brakes at this point here where my red dot is. And has, and has used a pretty good brake pressure and then has released. And you end up with this belly in, in this curve. 
And what we want to do is if, if, if the driver is able to stop this fast, you might want to consider you know, extending out the, you know, before hitting the brakes, go a little bit deeper and then use this, this, uh, this braking on this side all the way and, uh, and go a little bit deeper in the corner and save some time, obviously. Let's look at number two. It's the opposite way, isn't it? You have the red line that is uh, from the braking, the, the end of the braking zone from the beginning of the braking zone, and you've got a big hump here. And what the driver has done here is has hit the brakes, and this is more common. What I'm, we're looking at here is I see what much more often. You have the driver hitting the brakes, and then goes along here, and then gets down here about halfway through the braking zone, and then I looks up there at the at the at the apex and is getting ready to start that whole process, and needs to woe it down a little bit more. And the cart, the car or the car has it in it, which means that you could have extended the, the acceleration zone uh, leading into the braking zone as well. So you don't want to see these kind of things as well. And the same thing over here. And this one is a, is a much longer braking zone, but you can see the same thing. A little soft on the brakes early and creeps down, and then you know, it gets a little bit closer, and all of a sudden it re really you know, gets down on the brakes. And there's no arrow on these things and some other things that, that we don't have to worry about. We're going to make the assumption that's not here. But those are things that I just want you to, to, when you go back and you start looking at your own data, look at the braking side and understand that uh, these, are, these are important as well. Uh, Van was just, just threw a note up there. What about the relative slopes? I have not... Uh, talked about that yet. Uh, I think in a, in a slide or two we're going to see a little bit about that, but uh, the basic thing we just want to make sure we understand here real quickly is is these braking zones. Is when you get after the brakes really hard, these things should be fairly flat. And uh, e even if it's uh, relative to itself, you know, yes, there will be some that are steeper than other ones, and uh, but uh, but we want to keep that, uh, keep this as flat as possible and not have these bellies or these humps. Just watch, take a look at your own data when you get a chance and, and, uh, and look at that and see what you think. Certainly, w the next slide, let me go to the next slide and we'll talk about the relative slopes in a different way, the way that I like to look at it as well. We have not only, this is the same data, but now I've thrown up a second piece of information that's available to you with GPS systems, and that's uh, uh, longitudinal Gs. And, uh, and I've drawn a line in here at the zero, at the zero G area, just for uh, uh, to make it a little bit darker to see it. But so that same uh, braking zone number one, we can see that the lateral, the, the longitudinal G's, the driver has came down, and at this point here, is is, and you see that remember it was steep early, and then it kind of tails out and flattens out. It could be trail braking, it could be a couple things, but let's just assume, assume for a minute it's the braking zone, straight braking. And you can see that it, it starts to tail out here, but you can also see by the by the longitudinal G's that the driver hit has hit the brakes hard, and while still slowing, the, the longitudinal G factor is is reducing. So he's releasing the brake or has lost grip or you know, something has happened here, obviously. So at this point here, where my where the uh, where the red dot is right here, the driver has hit his maximum braking, maximum deceleration, and then from this point up. Is has, is using less deceleration, and that's why you get that uh, that little that, that less decel to up here at this point here. Let's look at the next one. It's even more telling. This one here, the driver threw the brakes at it pretty hard. You've got some deceleration, and then he's got this little flat area where he did the deceleration was sitting pretty much uh, uniform, and then hit the brakes harder again, which is exactly what the what the trace kind of shows. Is is got after the brakes went along pretty good and then really got after the brakes and you can see that in the deceleration. So if your eyes aren't picking up the deceleration, this this curve here as much, you can always bring up your lat longitudinal G's and you can really pick up where the uh, where the driver has, has stepped on the brakes even a little bit harder or got more grip or, or something to that effect. And you can really pick it out in the longitudinal G's. And then you can see the release as well. And we, we're not going to talk too much about the release side. That's the most important thing as you dig deeper and deeper, in my opinion, is that is that transition from brake on to, to throttle on. But, but I really wanted you to look at this piece of it as much today. Let's go to the third one. So you're hitting the brakes here again. Same kind of a deal. Here he releases the brakes a little bit. Of the, at least the longitudinal deceleration is not as hard. And then got after it again hard so it uh, the you can see that he really got after it. and here you're talking about your slopes of your uh, you know van had that question about the the individual slopes here at this point 
that slope, if we were to really look at the slopes, it's a little harder to see, but when you look at the, the longitudinal Gs, you can see that that point down here is deeper than the other ones. I like to use longitudinal Gs. It is, it's, it's something that means shows me a little bit uh, granular. You can, see, you can see the deceleration a little bit better when comparing lap after lap or driver after driver. So this one here, clearly there's more deceleration happening than just looking at the slope of it, but we can actually see it in the depth in the uh, longitudinal Gs, the negative longitudinal Gs. In, in our aim systems, negative is, is, uh, is, is, is breaking on the, on the longitudinal Gs. Please take a look at uh, your data as you, as, you, as you move on and start looking at some things and bring up that longitudinal G. I think you'll, uh, you'll see some interesting things there. Okay, the next one, we're going to step it in a little bit deeper. We talked, you know, the, the webinar 1.0 went over some of the basic, you know, some basic things. We talked about what is data and, and, and some different things. So this one here, we're going to jump in fairly deeply. I'm going to, I'm going to make the assumption that you, uh, you all watch that and, and uh, are up to speed on some of the topics we talked about there. So what we've just gone past is some basic things, and we're going to jump in a little bit deeper real quickly here. So this is, a, this is looking at some data. And, and uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about here is, is some math channels. And uh, this first next seven or eight slides, we're going to talk about some different ways of looking at data, not just by a sensor that you happen to have, but by taking that sensor data and, and manipulating it into something else. So the, um, let's take a look at this guy here. And, and the one that I'm going to talk about the most is this rolling lap time. And, and it, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. I'm going to show you the math channels in just a moment. And, and different ways of doing that. We can, we're, we're of course having to determine when the brakes are on and off. And that's what this, this graph here is showing us, when the driver has applied deceleration. And when it's at zero, there's nothing. When it's at one, the car is decelerating. We can make that happen with either GPS channels by looking at the longitudinal G and then making a math channel that says, if my longitudinal Gs are, you know, if I've got negative longitudinal Gs, the driver must be on the brake. And we can actually adjust that a little bit to 0.2 Gs so we, so we don't get those little areas right in the middle and, uh, and, and not understand fully what to, when we were on the brakes. If, of course, if you have brake pressure, it makes it much easier. A brake switch is part of your CAN data. We can, uh, we can actually turn this on. But don't, don't think you have to have, you know, some of those uh, higher-end sensors. So let's... Um, Let's, let's take a look at this. We've got our braking, and then we've got our throttle. The throttle in this particular case, uh, we'll, we'll look at the math channel in a minute, but that can also be whenever you're beyond 40% throttle position or when, you're, when you have your positive Gs of acceleration and, and make that over a tenth of a G or something. So don't, uh, again, we can do this with just some GPS channels, which is kind of handy, and, ma and the math channels, obviously. And it's as simple as, once you have these two, we can do another math channel. I'm going to show you these math channels in just a second and share them with you if you want them after the seminar. Is uh, Then we do this rolling lap time. And every place that there is either no brake or no throttle, we'll, you'll see that these little jump, these points jump up. Those are areas where the driver was rolling. You know, no, no throttle, no, no acceleration, no deceleration. And, you know, that, that can be false. Don't get me wrong. But because uh, sometimes you're in a long corner and you don't have that. You're, you've got all lateral. But, but it gives you a, a pretty good idea. So every time it does this, I've written a math channel that then takes every time it does not have C brakes or acceleration, it starts adding up the time. And at this point right over here, I just put the cursor at the end of the lap. I put the cursor right here, and it was 3.4 seconds on this particular lap that this driver was not not accelerating or not decelerating. And uh, so we could look at lap after lap after lap and take a look at that. But there's a there's a um, maybe even a, a better way. But I wanted to zoom in first and show you that this is that same exact chunk of data. And here I'm showing you that there's the braking, you know, the brake on. This one, the brake is on, and here's where he was on the throttle. This is, this is probably a shift point here. So as he's on the, on the throttle, and then he left, lifts off the throttle, and he gets over and starts to decel. And there's a, there's a gap there. So that is how this program works, is it starts to add up that time. I'll show you those math channels in just a quick second. But I just want to zoom in and give you a, even a better idea of what these, these, uh, these maces, and when, when, you don't, when you have zeros on both, that's what we're adding up. Okay, let's jump to the next slide, and I'll show you uh, one last third way to, that I like to see 
that uh, this is the one that I use the most when I build these math channels is the, the the rolling lap time. I go to what we call a channel report and it, I, can, I, I keep forgetting to turn on that little red dot. I go to a, the channel report and all these slides are going to have the icon that brought up the slide is always going to have this red box around it and it's going to be highlighted down here on the tabs and tell you what we're looking at in case you're not real familiar with the uh, with the, with the software. Then you can go into this add remove and you can actually set this channel up any way you want to this channel report and end up with showing the the amount of rolling lap time that the driver was rolling for each lap so it's uh if you, if you had 20 laps here of course this becomes even more uh, more valuable you can quickly scan and watch and see you know if the brakes were going bad or the driver was losing concentration or whatever it happens to be you'll see this grow and grow and grow if it's a if it's a if it's an endurance endurance race and you start getting to the end where the driver has to start challenging the car and drive and the other drivers this may may uh, actually creep down and get smaller and smaller so a very very powerful tool i'm going to show you some other ones that are just like this in just a moment but uh the the channel report is a great way of uh of stacking those up so you can really see them Here is the math channel. I thought I'd just show this to you and give you an idea of what the math channel function looks like in AIM. So here's the, uh, oops, let me turn on the pointer. Here's, the, here's the, the, the function that, the icon that opens up the function. And then I've highlighted the rolling lap time. I've got a few other math channels in there, but here's the rolling lap time. And there's the math channel. And uh, I've got a document that I'll share. I'm going to show you a screen capture of it in just a second, but uh, that I can share with you. It's got Gosh, as of right now, maybe 25 or 30 math channels that uh, that I have either found or wrote or 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 or, or thought up myself. So uh, this is just happens to be the one that we're looking at. It looks a little bit complex, but when you really start to read it, it's 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 not as bad. And we'll we're not going to get into the depth of it here. But uh, if you want to learn more about it, get back together with me. I'm probably going to build a video on on math channels and how and you know some of the power of them and and how to actually use them here shortly. So if I get ever get off the road, but uh, so there's a math channel for rolling lap time. Let's uh, let's jump to the next slide and uh, and uh, show you what some of them look like. So here's I talked about we can either use a brake pressure sensor to build that brake on. So we have to have brake on and throttle on to build those maces that we looked at a moment ago. So here's one that if I use brake pressure and if you read these it's it's pretty straightforward. If yeah, you got to jump around, but if the brake pressure is greater than 200, we turn it on. If it's not, it's a zero. Okay, so it, 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 you can kind of read it through and, and see the logic of it. On the throttle side, if the throttle position, in this case it's an MX-5 cup car we were looking at, but MX-5 throttle position is greater than 10%, it's on. If it's not, it's zero. We can also do the same thing with just GPS-based GPS, GPS -based systems. And what I I have played around a little bit with the numbers, and, and uh, different horsepower cars need different numbers, but this, this is something that will work pretty good. But, you know, if you're launching a acceleration is less than a negative five so it's getting bigger obviously but the higher negative number is less you know then we build it if not it's a zero it's a one if not it's a zero and the same thing on throttle on if the longitudinal acceleration is greater than 0 0.05 i've told it that's when the maces get built that's when it goes to a one these are totally user definable you'd want to play with a little bit and get uh you know for your car and your uh you know your acceleration and the way the car handles these are things that you probably would want to look at so the, uh, the the other one is the rolling lap time, and, and I've already showed you that a little bit, but there it is right there. And here's some other ones, some other driver performance math channels that uh, that I use. Is not only can we get the rolling lap time, but we can also then get the number the the number of seconds that you're on the brakes by just doing it, the integral of the brake on. The other thing we can do is is I've wrote this math channel. I use it a little bit. It's the number of feet that you're actually on the brakes. And then another one that uh, that uh, I find that uh, drivers that I've worked with uh, that, are, that are learning and getting up to speed, a, a partial throttle lap time, you know, the time that they're at part throttle. In other words, in this particular one, it's it's if your throttle position is between 10%, so you're not off the throttle, but you're 10% and you're not at full throttle, so you're less than 90. If you're between 10 and 90%, we're calling that partial throttle. Of course, these numbers are adjustable, and then you end up counting up that time that the driver was was spent on that uh, in that condition. So, the math channels are. And I'll show you a few more in just a second, but math channels really are all about your imagination, what you're trying to solve. If you're working with a driver, you're working with yourself, and trying to, and you and you think you have an issue here, X. 
well, let's think about ways that we can actually measure that and uh, and, and use math channels to even show it even better. So, so you would uh, you, you can uh, we can take a look at it and and uh, and help you build something. Don't don't get too scared off by the math channel idea. Let's work together on it and uh, and we can uh, and we can take a look at it. Here's a document that I've put together, and 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 uh, if you if you'd like it, it's not quite done yet. I got a few more cleanup things to do on it, but if you want to take a look at it, uh, I'll, I'll email it to you. What I would need is just an email from you uh, after the seminar. Give me a week or so to to clean it up and and get everything else. But as you'll notice here that. Uh, you know, it's basically I've give you a channel name. I've came up with a name. The naming is it can be certainly whatever you you wish. But but uh, break on and it, it tells you what it does, what you need in order to do it. In this case, with a GPS based one, and uh, and throws it out there. And then I've gone. I've also taken it and and looked at the aim channel parameters and 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 give you some ideas of maybe the best way to start as far as some of the settings. All, all adjustable as you go. Break lap time, break lap percent. If you want a percent of time, there's a math channel that we've created here that gives, calculates the amount of percent of time you are on the brakes for a lap instead of feet or time. So, uh, and on and on and on. And, and not just on per lap, we can actually do it on, on a full session as well. So all sorts of variations of all those different math channels. If you want something like that, give me a holler and we'll uh, we'll set you up. We'll maybe we'll do some one-on-one -on -one to get you up to speed with some of the things that... Uh, that we need to you need to make sure you do when you start working with math channels okay I see lots of good tips on the uh, on the things there so that's all good can you do percent of throttle over a lap Peter Peter Krause is asking absolutely and uh, we can do that in uh, you're gonna see it right now actually and uh, but uh, the uh, full throttle lap time and lap uh, partial throttle lap times and, and and on and on and on but yeah anything you want to do we can probably come up with it so I grabbed some other data just to show you some of the, the math channels we just looked at. So here we've got a break, uh, the amount of time you were on the brakes during the lap, and the number of feet. And you see it has a little bit different look to it because every time you're on the brakes, it's counting up the feet, and then it goes back to zero. And when you get on it again, it starts where it was and goes up, and it just keeps on climbing for the lap and then resets at the end of each lap, and it just does that automatically. So at the end of this, you can just click right here and get an, an idea of the number of feet or a channel report, which we're going to look at in a second here. Rolling lap time, we've already looked at that one. Partial throttle, times that you're at partial throttle, that just keeps adding up, and, and it's doing it. T is, in my case, the way I've named them is T is in time, F is, is, is feet. So we can, but we can make those be any, any output that you really want. Um, so full throttle lap time. All these things are available for you, and then when you go out and, you, and you're learning and you're doing things and you're getting up to speed, you can judge your your uh, how much more throttle you are able to get down and how much more percentage or less rolling when you you get your feet timed right when you're not when you're not on the throttle and or off the throttle and not on the brake yet. Things like that. You can watch these things, and then. And then, of course, then we take those same things. We generate that that channel report again, and we added a couple more in here just to see. And um, and now you can see the 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 break lap time over the course of just these three laps. And you can see that the, the 46, 45, 44. The driver here actually is getting better. It's, this was practice one of a of a driver that was new on the track, so you can tell that the lap he was braking getting more and more you know more aggressive as time went on and uh, and and you can see the actually less on the brakes less number of feet as he went as he went deeper into the session 4900 4800 4700 kind of interesting that uh, that you can can see this uh, the rolling lap time actually started to roll a little bit more but on and on so you make these math channels there's different ways we can look at them in, in in normal graphs or we can look at them in channel reports interesting stuff okay another math channel is a driver performance tool that uh, that you might want to look at is is the g g sum or uh, in an xy plot uh, and and do a g g sum channel and and all that really does, if you haven't heard of one before, is is it takes in this particular case I'm showing speed, and I'm showing lateral g's and longitudinal g's, and then I've written a math channel that is I'm showing it down here, but it's it just takes the square root of the laterals and the and the square root of the longitudinals and takes the square root of them, and you end up with a a channel that is that is combining these two uh, accelerometers acceleration channels. And what you're looking for 
is a nice smooth transition that you, when you when you're in under braking on your longitudinal right here and you see that the driver is doing some straight line braking here for a little bit and then starts turning in as he's releasing the longitudinal and releasing the brakes and is turning more and more what you really want is a nice smooth transition here this is a is, as I say down here in the bottom this is a poor example of a, of a g-sum I want you to see what one looks like that maybe isn't all that great and then we'll look at one that's a, is a little bit better what what you end up with here is these 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 sawtooth ridges, which means the driver has thrown a lot of straight line braking at it, and you can see that here. And then as he transitions off of the brake and into the into the lateral G's, there there is a release of the car, and then and then strong on the lateral G. So he's got this area that he's leaving leaving performance out on the track. Number one, he's leaving performance out on the track, but it also irritates the chassis, and 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 you'll, you know, your tires will overheat, and 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 a number of things happen here just because it's not being smooth. So, you uh, you end up working on on those kind of things. Let's look at a let's look at one that is a little bit maybe a, a little bit better of what you're probably going to look for. So here, here we've got a driver that is coming in, and uh, and and this is longitudinal, and I'm just there are other ones we can look at, but um, these these three here are 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 standard straight line braking to a corner and then turn. Some of these other ones where you see up here, those are transitions, lefts, rights, you know, quick chicanes and things like that. Those are hard to get quite right. But in this case, the driver has hit the brakes. And as the driver is releasing the brakes right here, you see that this is a, a fairly nice, smooth uh, uh, G-sum trace because he's he's traded off his, his longitudinal Gs as he's releasing that. He's building up on his lateral Gs. Which means that he's using actually most of the performance of the of the car out near the edge of the envelope and doing a pretty good job. What you don't want to see is what we looked at a minute ago by jumping back. What you don't want to see is is this kind of a thing where the where the car is you know teeter tottering and 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 uh, and really upsetting the upsetting the chassis. Okay, G sum. That's just another math channel, and those are uh, those are in. Uh, in Included in some of the st standard AIM ones as well, but uh, we can write you up one. And by the way, d these these math channels uh, are also importable, exportable by me, and 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 we can imp you can import them into your software, and they're just sitting there waiting for you. You'd have to fine tune them for some of you, maybe your different channel names. But but uh, if you want those, let me know, and uh, and, and I can export uh, a bunch of math channels for you, and they're already built, and you don't it makes it a lot easier for you as well. So let let me know if you want those as well. Okay. Let's jump to the next one. This is looking at the same kind of a thing as far as driver performance, and this is a this is this is a GG diagram, but in, in, we don't have a function that in in AIM that just has an icon here that gives us a a, a nice GG diagram. But the uh, but we can do it with an XY plot, and here's the function up here at the top. And by doing lo your longitudinal G's versus your lateral G's. The same thing we're, that we were looking at a minute ago in the GG diagram, you can actually see in, in, a, in a plot that's a little bit more graphic. So uh, in this case, I kind of call it the whale's tail. <clears throat> and uh, let me go to the next slide, and you'll get a, give you a better idea of what we're actually looking at if you haven't played with these before. This guy right here, let's say we're looking straight down through the roof of your car, and you're driving around the track. And uh, I'm an old surveyor, so I'll, I'll use the plumb bob ex uh, as a, as a as a demonstration. But as you're driving down the track and you and you uh, and you accelerate, the 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 plumb bob will swing to the back of the car, right? Because this is the, the speed direction is 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 uh, this is acceleration, so the plumb bob swings back. And then as you uh, as, as you hit the brakes, it would swing forward and make these dots every tenth of a second, right? So, and, and every tenth of a second, and then you then you're under braking, and then as you as you transition into a right-hand corner, you should be swinging around really nice like this, and then transitioning back to straight as you finish the corner, and then in in the acceleration mode. What you want to see in a good GG diagram is this area here to not be very full, not be too many points. There's always places that you're going to end up with some points in there but what you want to see is that fairly a fairly empty area in this place right here same as over here that means that this is your performance envelope and you've been staying out there you're you're running the car out there at the, at the, for the most part okay so you here is if the car was sitting dead still this is zero lateral g's and it's zero longitudinal g's so acceleration braking right hand turns and left hand turns okay
talk with me if you want to understand how to build these a little bit better. I've got, a, I think, some documents that I've written up I have not included here, but, but uh, to help you real quickly uh, build this really fast and then, and then save it. Okay. Let's look at the next screen. The next screen is, uh, I'm going to give you three different views of GG diagrams. That first one was pretty good. This one is, 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 is okay, but not great. And this is um, the background on this particular chunk of data. Uh, and you'll notice I've taken the names off of everything uh, you, just to hide the, hide the innocent. But the, uh, this one here happens to be a, a Mazda MX-5 driver development program, a young guy that came through the program and uh, ended up winning the, winning the ride for the year. And you can see that it's not quite a perfect uh, GG diagram. There's, you know, there's some areas here where he's not doing a, a really good job, but certainly a, a very good driver, clearly. And, uh, and, and yet there's some room for improvement. So wanted to show you what uh, a, a pretty good one looks like. Let me jump back to the one before. There's what the one from before looks like. That's actually a nice arc through here. And then the transition, and this is really kind of flat, so he's using maximum Gs coming off the corner all the way through the acceleration zone. This one looks pretty good. If we go back to the next one again, you can kind of see that this is almost almost flat you know, in these areas here. So he's not using the transitioning well from between braking to, to cornering. So, but, uh, but nonetheless, pretty good. Let me show you what one that, that is really poor looks like. This is, uh, you know, based on one, two, three, four, five, six laps. And this happens to be a GT3 cup car with a, an older gentleman that's just a, a gentleman racer having a, you know, track day kind of a guy, not even a racer. But he sends me some data and, and I help him occasionally and, and, I, and I use his data. And, uh, but this is what one looks like when the driver is not, you know, running at the, at the envelope, outer edge of the envelope of the car. You can see he spends a lot of time under acceleration, straight ahead acceleration and uh, and a, and 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 a, a bit of acceleration at only four tenths of a G but he doesn't do a whole lot of really pushing the envelope and certainly not from the braking transition and into the corner so this is one that uh, would need some improvement if the driver was really looking for uh, some room to to improve so that's a that's a poor example of a of a GG diagram Okay, that brings us to the end of, uh, of some of the driver performance stuff. I'm going to uh, take a sip of drink here. We're going to take a quick minute, a quick second, and then we'll, uh, we'll get back into the vehicle performance. Okay. Okay, vehicle performance. Let's talk a little bit about... Uh, the, uh, the looking at the performance of the vehicle and some different ways of doing that. This is one that I, I tend to like people to see and um, and understand. And it's it's basically uh, a slide, uh, a set of data that's, that happens to be Mossport up in Canada. And the way I I've got a speed trace, I've got a throttle position, I've got uh, lateral G's. And I've got steering position. And what we're looking for is under an oversteer. And it's one of the quick ways. There's there's lots of math channels out there and some other things that we can do. But the, it's this one here is a is a fast, quick, easy way for me to see uh, oversteer and understeer if you've got a steering position sensor and lateral G's, obviously. And so, so let's just take a look at it real quick. Basically, yeah, we're looking at uh, here's the, the front straightaway. This is turn one at uh, over here in the GPS map of uh, Mosport, and this is turn two. Those of you that have raced there before, turn two is one of those that's uh, that's uh, a pretty scary corner, pretty fast, over the top of a hill, off camber. And this is turn two right here in an MX-5 cup car. And uh, I'm going to zoom in on this in a minute, but um, you can see that the way that I set it up and the way I like to do it is, is in this case, the steering is the red one. Oh, and by the way, just so you know, there, I have actually two lateral Gs here. Uh, one of the questions I get a lot, and I thought I'd throw them up here just so everybody could see it, is I've got a, a, a normal sensor, which is the dark blue, uh, a lateral G sensor, and then I've got our GPS-based uh, G sensor that uh, out of this MXL and, and, a, and, a, and a GPS combination. And I just was going to show you that uh, how closely it actually traces in case you haven't ever, uh, haven't ever seen that and you wonder if GPS lateral and longitudinal Gs are fairly accurate. So I thought I'd throw it in here and just have it. 
so so I I I happen to um, set up my screen where the, the they're basically equal and opposites. And if you're if you if you have your steering position sensor like we're showing here, and you turn the steering wheel and you have perfect you know, no slide you know, no understeer no oversteer, you uh, when you turn your steering wheel you should get lateral G's. At, there comes a point when you will either continue to turn the steering wheel and you build no more lateral G's, and that would be to the driver is going to be understeer. You just keep turning the steering wheel and keep turning the steering wheel, <clears throat> and you get no more no more turn out of it, no more lateral G's, it's understeer. If you're turning the steering wheel the other way, kind of like right here, that would be oversteer. So you, you end up with a lateral G trace that looks pretty nice and smooth, but the driver is driving very hard to maintain that. So if you put your cursor right here, right where my red dot is, and you come down, you see there was a moment of oversteer where the driver had to cap capture it. But see the driver continued to, to press, continued to turn the steering wheel, continue, and this is in turn one, this is back here, continued to turn the steering wheel, and yet there was no more Gs. Classic sign of, uh, of, uh, of understeer right there at the, at the apex. And then releases the steering wheel pretty quickly and the Gs release. The one we're going to concentrate on, though, is this next corner. And uh, I'm going to zoom in on this guy here on the next slide and give you an idea of what we're looking at. Okay, same data. Turn two. So the driver starts to turn in as he's turning in here to the left. Turns in, turns the steering wheel, starts building Gs. And then right here, you notice that the steering he has a, uh, some counter steer and and clearly that's uh, there's an oversteer moment there because the G's are, are, are still sitting there in fact building still building some G's but he has had to almost back to zero you know he was uh, the steering wheel is at that point right where, they, where I've captured it right there is is almost 50 degrees of steering wheel angle right and then all of a sudden boom he has to turn it back almost to zero and uh, and he's at 94, almost 95 miles an hour, and uh, so you know it's a bit of a scary corner. So he had to capture that real quickly. And why did that happen? You, you always got to be like that little uh, that uh, your five-year-old kid walking behind you and asking why, 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 why? Because you need to dig in. You need to understand exactly what happened, or else you uh, you're not really solving the problem, right? So I, I put the cursor here. And I also highlighted right here where you can see that the driver's right foot, it's right at that, that same spot, has got after the throttle, right? Right when he gets after the throttle, you can see is he's, he's throttled up a little bit. He's up to probably you know, 15, 20%. And right there where he actually steps on it is right after that, you can see that the, the steering wheel correction has to happen. So the, in, in this particular case, there was some oversteer. And so to dig in a little bit deeper, did the car... Did the driver react to the car, or did the car react to the driver? You know, rhetorical question, I suppose, at this point, since we can't really talk much. But, but uh, clearly to me, the driver has jumped after the throttle, and you ended up with uh, a throttle on oversteer, right? So uh, when you get back and you're going to go to work on the car, dude, you, yes, we might want to try to get a little bit more rear grip, but in reality, you know, the drivers are paid to go out and get after the throttle, go through the corner as fast as they can get, and uh, and get after the throttle as early as they can. And if we never see anything like this, the driver's not trying, right? So so uh, it was interesting. At 90-whatever miles an hour through this fairly scary corner at Mosport, the, got a pretty good moment of oversteer, and the driver did have a little concern here with the throttle position trace, dropped off just a touch, and then uh, got back after it and kept on going. So uh, throttle on oversteer, the driver created the problem, but it's not a big deal, and, con and continued on. So you can see this stuff pretty easily in, uh, in, uh, in, in a measures graph by having the, these particular sensors up. Okay. Real quickly, we're gonna. This is a front-wheel drive Mazda uh, B-spec car in this particular case. And we just got some data here. I just wanted to show you uh, a couple of driven driven wheel speed differences. We in this particular case, it has a uh, a uh, an OBD2 connection to a to a Solo in this particular case, one of our our, our GPS-based data logger products. And but we can connect to the to the to the OBD2 CAN network and grab some data. In this case, the two front tires is what we're looking at here, including the brake pressures and the and the throttle position. We would dig deeper and deeper, but I just wanted to show you, it was just kind of interesting that uh, as the driver comes in and, and hits the brakes coming down this uh, this braking zone here, and then to see the, the, the light front tire as the driver turns to the left and the inside tire get light and the, and the, and, and the, the 
the anti-lock brakes start applying themselves and, and keeping it from doing too much and then gets back after the throttle right here and you can see that the inside tire now is uh, is light and, and attempting to spin and uh, and the traction control keeps it uh, under control until you know these things don't have a ton of horsepower and then gets going back and running down the straightaway so it, another interesting way of looking at data if you're uh, wondering about your differential or how things are working and if you have a couple of speed sensors it's very very clear to see exactly what happens when you're on the brakes or, or, or stepping on and off the throttle you can really see what happens with the with the two wheel speeds this particular car has four wheel speeds but we're just looking at the driven wheels so interesting stuff uh, multiple wheel speeds is it's pretty interesting data, and you can see pretty quickly that there's some, some interesting things that happen. Okay, a couple just, uh, one of the questions I get a lot is how can I use data to understand shift points and and uh, maybe understand if I'm shifting too early or too late. You know, in some of the cars that uh, a lot of you probably run with the Spec Miatas, it's pretty much you go to the red line. But, but uh, just to give you an idea of, of different ways of looking at that, I thought I'd throw some up here for you. In this case, I've got a, a speed trace. I've got an RPM trace. And I've got uh, a gear position and longitudinal Gs. And I'm going to look at this in like three or four different ways. This is just the first slide just to give you an idea. But uh, we can look at the longitudinal acceleration, and if we wanted to, we can do derivatives of the of the acceleration up here as well. But this is a this is a pretty good idea. And you can see that the longitudinal g's as he's coming up to the shift point here, and he's about 7,300 right at this point. But but uh, coming up to the shift point, you can see this thing is the the acceleration curve is coming down nearer to the zero point. And uh, and if you just can, if he just continued to to go there when when the motor has peaked and has run out of horsepower, uh, out of the horsepower band, this thing will just continue to go down and it'll just sit here flat, right? So right at that point, the driver has shifted, and you can see that there all of a sudden it has a little bit more acceleration beyond that. I mean he's up into fifth gear, but but uh, gives you an idea of kind of what it looks like. This next one to the right is actually even a better way of looking at it. A better it might be a little bit smoother section of the track. Here you can see that the driver is in is in is in fourth gear and he's getting ready to go to fifth gear, but uh, the acceleration is dropping off and dropping off. And right there you can see where he shifted, and you can see that it picked up pretty good acceleration beyond that. It's not a perfect way of looking at it, but look at your longitudinal G's and, and you can pick up uh, pick up some pretty good ideas of where you may have gone too far. If you were to draw a straight line down this at the rate that it's dropping off in acceleration real quickly you can see you'd be below where it is after the shift and that's really what you're looking for obviously the v here is where the where the driver actually shifted but let's look at it even a different way just to give you an idea of of some of the tools that are available to you and this is that same exact data and i know that when you first look at this it just looks like a whole bunch of bunch of dots right and there's just a whole bunch of stuff that you can't really tell but what we're looking at here is an xy plot so we're looking at not not just a channel uh, on the uh, x-axis of distance, but in this case, we're looking at longitudinal Gs versus RPM. So we're looking at two channels being applied against each other, another xy plot. And in this case, you can see the trends of all these dots. And, and we could write some math channels to get rid of some of this other stuff, but you can still see them, and I circled them for you. But here is where the, the lo longitudinal Gs are dropping the general trend of this this bunch of lines right here, a bunch of dots right here, you can see that the general trend over one, two, three, four, five laps is they're dropping down. And, and you can see if you if you really start to look at a trend line is, is right about here, you can see it that it really starts to drop off, the trend line does. And so right here it's it's starting to lose it at maybe 60, 6900, 60, a little over 6800. But we know where the next gear is, is where the next point after the shift, you can see what the acceleration rate is, and that uh, this is still substantially above it. So, as I, if I was to be studying this, I would be looking at this, going, well, at this point, you know, it's got a 7,300 rev limiter, or so. So it's coming down here, and it's it's really falling off here like crazy. Well, where would you want to shift? And you'd start to try to understand where the balance point is of where it really drops off, where you have more horsepower, more wheel speed torque more 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 acceleration after the shift and it's it's about at that point the driver was doing a pretty good job of uh, in this particular case of shifting at the right point
So other ways of looking at it, don't just, don't just think of looking at a speed trace and kind of see where it goes flat. You have some other tools available to you with longitudinal Gs and XY plots. And, and, and in this case, we even have what, uh, what we call a RP, engine RPM analysis that, uh, that works fairly well. So I took that same data and I looked at uh, the, uh, the, the, all of the laps that we were just looking at, and you can apply through, the, through this settings button up here. You tell it how, how heavy the car is and, and a few other things about it, what channel is, which one is the RPM channel, and all these different things. And then we work a horsepower and torque uh, backwards, and we end up with a, uh, with, with a chart of all the dots of where the the calculated horsepower values were at, at different spots on the track and then we basically just draw a line around it and then you end up with a a horsepower you know horsepower here on the left column and torque on the right column and it, all these three last three slides are all the same exact data but so here you can see that the horsepower was falling off 156 163 66 and then it starts to fall off at that 69 to, to 7000 rpm range and falls off pretty darn quickly at 7300 so if you st take a look at this you can see the trend here is basically the same thing as we saw in the uh, in the longitudinal g's and just the strip graphs and then the same thing that we saw in the xy plot so it, in my mind it's all kind of bearing uh, the same ideas and the same results but we have different ways of looking at different things so use all the tools that are available to you just another uh, another way of using the software to get what you're after i like to share this one uh, w with folks just so you have an understanding of, of of tire temperatures and what happens out on the track this happens to be on a on a, on a cart but but uh, uh it just gives you a pretty quick idea of of using what would kind of a non-standard tool and, and being able to see pretty quickly uh, a handling characteristic of this cart so if you if you if you let your mind just kind of look at this and the left front tire is the blue one up here and the right front tire is the black one and by the way these are single infrared tire temperatures pointed at the center of a of a go-kart tire on all four corners we're not getting left outside middle you know uh inside outside middle uh, for doing you know normal camber things and stuff like that on this particular one but just gives you an idea it's kind of interesting of just a, a general surface tire temperature and you'll see that uh the left front is the blue the right front is the black and the same thing back here the, the left side is red is blue and the right side is black and if you've ever ran a cart and your and your start finish line is right here, and you know that when you go into a turn with a cart, it has to lift the inside tire of the rear because it has it's a solid rear axle, and and so and it'll plant really hard the outside tire. And so in this particular case, the first turn is a long left hander, and what you generally would see is the right rear tire would spike up in temperature. It is the loaded tire, and in this case, it's kind of interesting to see that in in about 100 feet, it goes from 160 degree Fahrenheit surface temperature to a, about 185, about a 25 degree instant, very, very instant uh, temperature rise. Interesting stuff. And then back down and in fact cools off, uh, you know, back down to like 152, 155. And all of that happens over the course of about 200 feet. So uh, I used to carry around my, my infrared tire temperature and, and Andrew would come off of with his go-kart and come off the track and we'd put the cart up on the stand, push it out of the way, and then I'd take some tire temperatures until I seen how quickly things were changing. But really the interesting thing about these are these two circled areas here. And the, the driver sent me this data because the cart was, uh, well, it was a four-stroke junior one, very low horsepower cart for his daughter. And uh, they kept having motors were overheating and the thing just kept going slower and slower. And uh, so he sent me the data to look at, and I happened upon finding that there was a chassis problem because of the tire stuff. Now, I didn't find a motor problem, but I found a chassis problem, which was creating the motor problem. It was interesting to see that when the driver went up here and turned the uh, you know, on this first infield hard right-hander, tight right-hander, which is this guy, it, uh, it was not lifting the either tire. It was planting the, uh, the, the, the left rear like it should, but the right rear was dragging along as well. And because of that, then you can see by the left front generating a ton of heat real quickly that it had an understeer problem. Because it was not lifting up the inside rear tire, the cart has an understeering problem and the left front tire was uh, was heating up like crazy. So you can see the understeer, the chassis problem here, 
with, uh, with with tire temperatures. Same thing down here. The rest of them all look pretty good. They're 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 building heat on the tires that should and not on the tires that shouldn't until we get back into a, another tight right hander. See the trend? Another tight right hander, and you see that both rear tires heat up through the corner and heavy heat on the left front. Where it, certainly showing an understeering problem on, on the uh, on the right hand on the right hand corners so um, what they had done is they tried to offset the cart to turn really well one way and they overdid it and it didn't turn it all the other way so this quickly uh, interesting that tire temperatures point out a chassis issue it's fun stuff to look at wanted to share that with you just more sensors you can play with let's talk a little bit about vehicle health we've got about uh, about 20 minutes left for our, our design time, so we were doing okay on on our, on our time. The uh, this particular one is some oil pressure into the vehicle health side. Okay, we've helped the driver a little bit. We've shown you a few things of ways that we can help driver. We've showed you a few things of how we can help set up the car. Let's talk about the health of the car. In this case, oil pressure. Look at that oil pressure trace. It's pretty erratic and it's moving around. The trouble is, is we're looking at that and you. And you can kind of start to understand. Well, why is it? Why is the oil pressure dropping? You know, right here. I've got, I've got speed and I've got RPM. But why is the why is the oil pressure dropping? It kind of looks like it's tied a little bit to to braking. Certainly low RPM there. Trouble is, is we got a low RPM here or a low oil pressure and it's accelerating. You know, it's right after the corner. It, it, uh, there's trends here, but you got to find out what the trend is so you know what to fix, right? So this is we can kind of come up with some ideas here but it uh there, there might be better ways of looking at it so let's look at the data in a different way in this particular case we now we're looking at oil pressure up the y-axis and we're looking at lateral g's across the bottom all looking for things ways to look for trends and try to find when these oil pressure issues are happening and in this particular case there uh it was and I, you can do this on lateral G's and longitudinal G's, but in this case we're looking at uh, you know, oil pressure versus, versus cornering forces. And you can tell over the course of these four laps that really down in here is where the low oil pressure spikes are happening the most. There are some up in this area, but uh, probably under braking there, but it's really bad under braking and, under, and, and turning left in this particular case. So the XY plots can start to bring up uh, trends in data that you normally would not see and that's an interesting one there okay time to work on that oil pan right and then I uh, I'll follow that up with what you know we had one bad oil pressure and let's look at uh, let's look at what a what a decent oil pressure looks like and in this case the the oil pressures no matter over the course of four laps is the oil pressure is uh, is always up here at the top this is a dry sump motor versus a wet sump motor of the one that we looked at a minute ago, obviously. And it, so you're going to get much better oiling. But I wanted to show you what one looks like when it when it uh, when you've got a dry sump motor and, and and really good oil pressure. Why the lines of data? You see these little lines where the blue line, the dots are all kind of lined up, and then it just keeps on spooling across here. Little things like that you can see real quickly in a, in an XY plot, and what that is is. You notice that uh, these are four laps fairly early in the in the race, and uh, the temperature of and the viscosity of the oil is fairly good here, and it's dropping slowly, not a ton. It dropped from maybe 60, you know, from beginning it was about 80, and it's down to about 65 here at the end, which you can see here from about 80 here to about 65 here, and these are just individual laps of the dotted, you know, the the, the data in the XY plot showing that it's slowly losing oil pressure over time due to viscosity loss. Just another interesting thing to see. Okay, and by the way, this is uh, that first one. This is a road race BMW uh, Pro 3 car here in the in the Northwest, and uh, that one's an off-road race truck. So this one's bouncing around like crazy compared to the to the road race car. It's just the uh, dry sumps really really solve your problems. Kind of interesting. Let's see. The next one is fuel pressure. The next one is fuel pressure, and 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 again, we're looking at you know speed, RPM, and uh, and big dropouts in the fuel pressure. In this case, you can kind of see that it is you know there are trends where the RPM is dropping. You know it drops. You know this one here actually started to fall even before even before it at, at some level, right? So we want to look. Okay, what's some ways to look at that data to to understand the uh, 
Van sent a question, asked, does the resolution of the sensor make more of the rows? Uh, the resolution, it, it, the, the, we're talking probably 10 samples per second, you know, it, at the low end, maybe if you really turn it down, you might get two samples per second. Yes, if you really slow down that uh, sampling rate or the resolution of that sensor, you, you would probably start to see some strange things. That's why some people do temperatures at one sample per second, just because it's you know it doesn't change real quickly. But uh, pressure sensors and temp sensors, I, I'd uh, I'd like to have them up you know five to ten typically, so I can look at uh, uh, the data and see a little bit general trend. That's my opinion on it at least. Okay, fuel pressure. We have this graph here, but again, we, we see the fallouts, but we, we need to look at the data a little bit deeper to understand what, uh, you know, why is it dropping at this point. So let's look at the data in a couple different ways. Maybe this is the way that a user might, that, that, uh, that I might have looked at the data real quickly in just different ways. First thing that I might have looked at is a, is a simple uh, histogram. We have a function up here at the top that, uh, that takes the data of the channel that you have active, in this case, fuel pressure, and it and it, you click on the histogram button and it takes and places that data it breaks it up for the entire one two three four five laps that I've selected and it tells you in, in in this case percent but you can do it in time as well but percent of those time of those laps it was at 41.4 percent of the time it was between 54 and 56 psi and so it, all this, it might be interesting to know in some cases, but in this particular case of my fuel pressure problem, I kind of already knew that it was decent fuel pressure and had times of no fuel pressure. So this just reinforces what I kind of already know. So this really isn't much of a, doesn't really solve my problem, right? So let's look at it in another way. So then I went to an XY plot. And so I plotted up PSI, up this side, up the Y axis, and I plotted up speed across the bottom. In reality, while that shows me some interesting things, it doesn't answer my question as, as well still, right? There is high fuel pressure at all different mile per hours, and there's low fuel pressure at all different miles an hour. Well, that's not the, that's not the trend, right? So we'd, uh, so we'd want to take a look at uh, maybe in another way. So let's take, a look, let's take a look at another way. So in order to change an XY plot, I thought I would just kind of walk you through the steps real quick just so it's see how easy it is. You, you click on the little settings bot, little wrench here that brings open the settings, the setup box, and so instead of uh, instead of speed that I have across the bottom, I'm going to change it to throttle position. And this maybe don't show me everything I need to know, but at least it'll tell me if I'm safe. That, you know, it's not lean when I'm uh, at full throttle. Let's let's take a look if if it's lean at full throttle or or uh, or rich where it should be, or at least by pressure wise. So I'm I'm I've got dots set up here, and uh, I'm going to select throttle position as my as my uh, x axis instead. So I'm going to click on the apply and exit button, and now I end up with another trend line that I can kind of take a look at and here I've got my fuel pressure still on the y-axis and I've got my throttle position on the on, on the x-axis and while I still don't know what is happening what I can tell the guy that I'm that, that I'm looking at the data for is when he is at the at the near full throttle that ha happened to have a slipping cable can you see that we actually caught that because of this you know the the trend is, is getting full throttle is uh, is less and less as he was going but so we found a slipping cable but basically you can see that the, when the driver is at full throttle or near full throttle he has the appropriate uh, fuel pressure the fuel pressure dropouts are happening as the driver is getting down to zero or near zero percent to throttle. So that, that probably still could be longitudinal G's. It, it could be a number of things, but, but uh, for that day when we couldn't fix it, this made the driver feel a little bit better that he was, when he was at full throttle and accelerating, he had the fuel pressure to keep his, uh, keep his motor from burning up so, and, and, and continuing to run well. So uh, while we didn't totally solve it, we ended up solving it later, but uh, I just wanted to show you that uh, just another way of looking at the data. All sorts of tools in there for you. And one more uh, vehicle health way of looking at one of the things that I tend to always look at early on it came from our, our carting background when you used to tape up the radiator to get the temperatures right. We started to look at uh, water temperatures in a general trend. So I'm looking at the entire water temperature run from startup to where he started the race 
all the way until the end of the race here and then the cool deal of the end lap and what you can look at here now up in this area we're looking at some more detail only from here from the beginning of the three out laps getting ready to get the race started and then the actually getting the green flag on the beginning of our fourth lap in the aim data so from right here is where he got the green flag and he was only at 140 344 degrees of temperature and then as he went it got up here and ended up at the, the 161 degrees at this point and then pretty much held that the rest of the race it might have been cooling down just a touch here right at the end but you can see where you main where you achieved and stabilized that you're uh, at, at the temperature that it was uh, was not going to change any anymore so it was just kind of interesting to to be able to look at uh, water temperatures oil pressures all these things and you kind of see when they stabilize In this this particular case he's halfway through the race before this thing ended up with a temperature that was uh, that was stable, so you can kind of pick that stuff up pretty quickly. Just another way of keeping the keeping the race vehicle healthy. Okay, we got about 10 minutes left to go. I'm I'm actually did pretty good on time for the first time giving this particular session. So, uh, tips and tricks. Let's look at over a couple things, and some of these things are available in that document, that tips and tricks document that you may have downloaded as well already. But but uh, let's look at a couple of these. First one is profiles, and uh, profiles are just a super, super important tool for you to get to know and understand. One of the most powerful tools that we have. And what you'll uh, profiles are, and I know this got way too small, but I, 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 I capture wanted to capture them. But when you're looking at the measures and tool uh, measures graph over here on the left side of your of your software. Most people don't understand that's even there, but there's there's three tabs across the top of that, and one of them says user profiles, and user profiles are nothing more than storing favorite views, and and you can store virtually everything. So you can store functions, you can store colors, what channels are shown, the color widths, the the. the how wide you have each of these windows. All that stuff is saved in a profile. So basically what you do is you get your software. If you always go in and you always look at, you always have speed at the top, and you want it to always be green, and you want RPM, and you want you know, brake pressure and throttle position. Kind of a driver's uh, way of looking at the data, right? Whatever. And uh, you find yourself always wanting to look at the data that way. Well, let's save it as a profile. And the way that you save it as a profile is you just click on the on this little plus button in underneath this profile tab. As soon as you do, it opens up this dialog box and it says, well, give it a name. And you plug in your name of what you want. It might be driver main or you know whatever it happens to be. And then you click on OK. And then from then on, you have keyboard shortcuts. Or you can go inside there and click on a little uh, a load button. But uh, the, the top one is, is Control-1. The next one is Control-2 and etc. All the way through Control-9. So you have nine that are accessible by by keyboard shortcuts. So in this particular case, I saved three of them just real quickly this afternoon just uh, as I was going along. They ended up being a little too small to see well. But but uh, the first one was just my th that braking graph that we looked at with speed, my throttle my throttle on and my brake on, and my, my roll time. And maybe that's something I always want to look at, so I just saved it as a profile, and I called it roll, rolling lap, and, and it was saved as a control one. And then the next one I wanted to store is I closed everything and just just opened up a channel report with that information and I saved that as control 2 or profile 2 and then I had a suspension analysis uh, that I wanted to I always want to jump in there third let's say so I save that one out and then ne ne every time you open up your data you download a t test maybe there's five or six ways you always want to look at your test and you want to quickly get through it so you can start working on the car or you know, going over and giving your buddies a hard time or whatever whatever it happens to be. And uh, you can quickly run through these things because you've saved the view. So you bring it up, boom, control one. It opens it up exactly how you like it with the right colors, the right sizes. Everything is set up for you. And then control two, control three, control four. You open them up and you, and you pop your way through the data and you look at your vehicle health stuff. And maybe you have one page that has nothing but water temperatures and oil pressures and, 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 and all these different things. You can quickly see them and then you can... At that point, you're going to say, I'm happy with everything that I see. Close the laptop and go to work. Uh, or you, you start digging in under the why. You know, why, why is that happening? i got to dig in a little bit deeper. But profiles are a huge, huge time saver for you. You quickly can run through your, your typical tasks. And if, if down the road you're working along and you say, hey, I've this new way I like to look at data all of a sudden. Well, as soon as you get it the way you like it, Hit on the profile tab, hit on the little plus sign, and save it. And then from then on, you've got control five is this this way you want to look at your data all the time. 
huge, huge time saver that, uh, that you can pop through your, your normal things and get it done really quickly. Profiles, work with them a lot if you, if you have a chance. Um, just start kind of tinkering with them. You, you can build them, you delete them, and pretty soon you get a pretty good handle on what you want and you end up with a nice clean set and you're, uh, and you're off and running. Some folks really, really like keyboard shortcuts. So the, uh, uh, I went through and I made a document that, uh, that takes all of the keyboard shortcuts that are available to you in Ray Studio Analysis. And, um, and I just went through and, and you can go in there and you can show the track map and it, Shift F1 does that. Or there's a menu that does that map, show track map, map manager, generate a new map as Shift F4 or map new. And, and this just gives you a list in case you want it that's, uh, that's available for you to, uh, to have all the, con all the keyboard shortcuts available for you. One of the ones that many, many, many people don't know that is very, very powerful is the uh, the, the measures toolbar, that the, the toolbar on the left edge that has all the channel names and all the values. Sometimes you want to get rid of that real quickly to buy a little more space, and that's the uh, control space bar. And then if you the toolbar, the test laps toolbar, it's across the bottom that shows each individual each individual lap. Sometimes you want to get rid of that, and you can just hit the space bar. So those are just some uh, some some uh, some quick things to uh, to to get rid of and find different things. So all the keyboard shortcuts uh, are available to you here. I have it in a PDF document if you want it to. Race Studio configuration has that same. Um, has some has some keyboard shortcuts as well, and uh, so I included those in this as well. Okay, here's a real quick document that uh, you might want to just keep in mind as you're as you're looking at as your data in, in Windows or wherever you save your data. There are a bunch of different files that get built with every uh, with every download that you do. And you know you have a DAT file. The IMD is some Micron 4 carding product stuff, but it has a DAT file. And then you have the, 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 the that's the kind of the main big file that comes off your dash and into your uh, onto your computer. From that gets generated the DRK file and the GPK file. And that the DRK is the main data file, and the GPK is the main GPS file. And then there's a bunch of other ones here. We're not going to go through them all in particular, but but these are all getting generated as you do different functions and different steps inside of the software. And uh, and all the way down to uh, you know some beacon shifts and some other stuff. But the bottom line is down here across the bottom. If you want to share data with me, or you want me to look at some data, or you want to share data with your buddy, is uh, really the only only files you need to do is 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 save is is send the DRK file and the GPK file, and uh, and those will reduce your email file size in case it's a large file. If you just do a export, you will get all of the different files and certainly the DAT file, which makes a, a, a fair, sometimes the DAT file is always by far the largest file. And we don't need that in order to open up the test on your buddy's computer or my computer if I'm gonna help you. So you can, uh, don't, don't no need to send the DAT file. If you just send the DRK and the GPK, the rest of these files will all be regenerated when the, when the new user opens up that test. Okay, so keep that in mind if you're trying to keep things small. If it's a small test, like uh, Peter just mentioned, you can just you know click on a test in the test database, and and it, it has the option of zipping that thing together and putting it right into an email for you. But that it does also send ev all the different files that are associated with it at that point. So, so it uh, if if the file size is not too large, go ahead and use that the functionality inside the inside the software. But uh, if you're trying to get small and send a bunch of data and not not clog up the email, DRKs and GPKs is all you really need. Okay, as we're, as we're kind of closing this up, the, uh, uh, the, this is my data disclaimer. And so I'd like to, like to talk about this a little bit because some of the stuff we talked about maybe isn't exactly the right way you'd want to do data work, but I think I hit on it a several times. But data is great, and you, but you, uh, you still really need to understand that data and interpret the data correctly. It's it, it, it data acquisition is just a tool, and it's uh, it's out there to make things you know work great for you. But uh, you have to understand it and you have to interpret it correctly. There's, there's there's not if I jump down to the third one, there's not a button that tells you what springs or camber or or where to set your tire pressures. And uh, you know the, even if those guys found that, I probably would not share that with you because then I'd be out of a job and wouldn't exactly need a training manager at that point, right? So uh, <laughs> that's a joke. The uh, but always look for trends, and that's the point I'm trying to make is is we looked at some data today and 
for ease of use and ease of being able to look at things, sometimes we would only look at a single lap. And um, you know, but uh, in, in the real world, when you're out working with your data, you really you never want to make a change based on just one data point. You want to you want to look at some data and like those breaking zones. You you'd uh, you would have brought three or four speed traces up and looked at the and make sure the driver was being consistent. And then you might want to go look at uh, you know maybe look at some video or or you know why is the why is the always braking harder when it gets down to the apex? Does the track start to go uphill where you can brake harder? Little things like that. You you always got to outthink. You got to you got to be one step ahead of uh, you know data can lie at times, but uh, you know, for the most part it's right on the money. But you just have to keep your mind open on other things as well. You're still in charge. You're still in charge. You just are doing this making all these decisions with much more accurate information based on solid data. And that's really what data data is really all about. And and uh, and and that's what's critical. A little bit of a closing slide here just to give you some information. There's some contact information there. My email address, most of you already obviously have that. Those videos that we talked about uh, that are, are at a Vimeo site. Most of you have probably seen that. This video from this, uh, this webinar will end up there as well. The other thing that you can do, the way that AIM uh, disperses information is either via our, our Twitter account at, at AIM Sports or Facebook, you know, forward slash AIM Sports. That's the way we get all our information out. We don't have mailing lists that we send stuff out to for the most part. And uh, so if you want to follow along and keep up with new software and when the new MXL2s and those things are going to be out, it really is where when it, when it will be uh, pushed out to the to the public and let everybody know about firmware updates and everything is really versus on the on the on the Facebook account typically so keep that in mind uh, join in there and like that uh, like that and I'm going to be posting more and more stuff there all the time as well so with that said I'm uh, we are exactly at seven o'clock I want to seven o'clock Pacific I want to thank you guys for all coming uh, I appreciated it uh, if if uh, if you liked what you saw, make sure you share with uh, with all your Facebook friends and let them know that uh, we're out there doing these kind of things and that, that there's value to it. And uh, and let everybody know, and we can go from there. Please send me an email if you want some of those things. I see some emails have came in. And uh, let me know if there's anything else I can do for you. If you want to implement some of these things we talked about, get together. We'll do a one-on-one -on -one and, uh, and, uh, and look at your data and do these things for you. So I appreciate you coming. That's the end of the seminar, and uh, we'll see you at the track.